Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and the Predator prequel, Prey, has finally arrived, and it is awesome. So we're going to break down the parallels between this film and the original Predator, but we're also going to dive into the surprising social commentary this film had to offer regarding the horrible treatment of Native Americans by European colonists, as well as how it breaks down the barriers on societal gender roles. Then we're going to talk about that epic ending and what it could mean for the future of the Predator franchise. Now, while this film is technically a prequel to the 1987 film Predator, it's not a prequel in the sense that it shows the origins of the Predator. Some fans had speculated that Prey would be to Predator what Prometheus was to Alien. but it's not that at all. Prey really is your standard Predator film. Predator comes to Earth. Predator kills some humans. Predator and the humans fight. The end. <laughs> but one of the things that makes this film stand out amongst the other Predator films is the era it takes place in, 1719. That's 268 years prior to the first film. That means no machine guns or helicopters. Get to the chopper! The film follows Nauru, a young Comanche woman who lives with her mother and brother. Nauru doesn't long for the life assigned to her based on her gender. She doesn't want to be a gatherer, she wants to be a hunter. This is a situation we find in many stories with young protagonists. They want to be something more. They want to take a different path other than the one that's been laid out for them, typically laid out for them by their elders. Your father left you that to cut bread root with. I almost got a deer with it. Take Luke Skywalker, for example. He's a farm boy from Tatooine who is expected to farm for the rest of his life like his uncle before him. There's more to life than your farm, Owen. But Luke longs for being more than a moisture farmer. He has dreams and aspirations that aren't just mere desires. They're his destiny. And the same goes for Nauru. She has to hunt. It's who she is. And she's damn good at it, too. Next time you're cooking. Naru's refusal to fall in line with the role that is expected of her causes friction in her life, both with her family and with her tribe as a whole. She's looked at as different and not a team player. Naru being born to hunt shows a direct parallel to the Predators. These are creatures that we as fans know to be basically intergalactic game hunters. When the Predator arrives on Earth, Naru sees its ship flying through the clouds. She thinks the ship is a Thunderbird. I saw a sign. The Thunderbird. A Thunderbird is a creature of legend in many indigenous cultures. The Thunderbird is said to create lightning and thunder as it flaps its wings while flying in the sky, the same way the Predator ship did. Naru takes this supposed Thunderbird sighting as a sign that she is ready to be taken on her first big hunt. I've been practicing. It's time. I'm ready. When she tells her brother this, he says to her, You really think you're ready? You want to hunt something that's hunting you. This, of course, foreshadows that the two master hunters, Naru and Predator, will soon be hunting one another. And speaking of Naru's first big hunt and the parallels between her and the Predator, I think that the Predator in this film may in fact be on its first big hunt. You'll notice that the ship it comes in doesn't land, but simply drops off the Predator and then flies away. This makes me think that the Predator has been dropped off on Earth by its fellow Yachal, that's the name of the Predator species, for its first big hunt. And its mission is to find the strongest and most formidable warrior on Earth, kill it, and then bring back its skull when the hunt is over. This is also similar to many tribal cultures on Earth, where a boy would be sent alone in the wilderness to hunt to prove his manhood. That's why in this film, the Predator has no interest in killing things it doesn't deem to be a threat, because that's not why it's there. We're the bait. He's coming for us. No, it doesn't want bait. It doesn't hunt that way. Before the trappers captured me, it saw me. It came right up to me and then left. I didn't think I was a threat. In the film, we get to see the Predator go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a rattlesnake, a wolf, and a grizzly bear. <laughs> Naru witnesses the fight between the Predator and the bear. I couldn't see it until it was covered in blood, but it looked like... like a moot beats. <laughs> you saw a monster from a children's story? At one point in the film, we see Naru come across a field of skinned buffalo. Now, at first, you may think the Predator is responsible for this heinous act, but when Nauru reaches down and finds a cigar laying by one of the bodies, it becomes clear that this was done by colonizers. You 
killed the buffalo. We also get to see yet another parallel between Nauru and the Predator as the Predator approaches the skinned buffalo and looks at the cigar that was left behind. Earlier in the film, Nauru is in pursuit of a deer with her dog, who I'm happy to report survives the movie. Thank the maker. The dog gets its tail caught in a bear trap. This trap is a hint that the predator isn't the only predator out there. It is later revealed that this trap belongs to the French fur trappers. And this is also when it becomes clear who is responsible for the skinned buffalo that Nauru and the predator both found in the open field. You killed the buffalo. Colonizers killing buffalo for sport wasn't uncommon during this time. They knew that the natives relied on buffalo for food, clothing, and shelter. The natives would use every part of the buffalo for survival. So this tactic of butchering buffalo was used by colonizers to hurt natives by depriving them of their livelihood. So I'm so glad the film acknowledged the predatory actions that were taking place during this time in North America and juxtaposed these three styles of predatory behavior between the colonizers, Nauru, and the predator. After the fur trappers catch her Naru, it's revealed that they also have her brother. They use her and her brother as bait to lure in the predator, but this of course doesn't work because... It doesn't want bait, it doesn't hunt that way. Then we get to see one of the most badass predator slaughterings ever. Predator absolutely decimates the fur trappers, and while he's doing that, Nauru and her brother escape back to the fur trappers' camp. Here we see yet another parallel between Nauru and the Predator. Nauru is treating her wounds, and the Predator is treating his, both preparing for their inevitable showdown. At the camp, Nauru is approached by the translator from earlier in the film. And speaking of translating, can I just take a moment to voice a little nitpick? Why are these Comanches speaking fluent English? Sure, many natives learned English as colonization became more and more rampant, but they wouldn't have spoken it amongst themselves. They would have spoken Comanche. And when they do speak English, it would not sound so contemporary with today's English. Who invited you? We won't be gone long enough to need a cook. Not even English speakers in 1719 would have spoken English the way it's spoken in this film. And look, I get it. They want to appeal to a large audience. And shooting the film in Comanche and having subtitles would have turned off a lot of viewers. But personally, I think it would have made the film even better. Anyway, the translator shows up missing a leg and begs Nauru to help him. She treats his wound and gives him pain medicine. The translator then exclaims that he's freezing. What's happening? I'm freezing cold. This is because the medicine drastically lowers your body temperature. And if you'll remember, the predators read heat signatures. This brings us back to the original Predator when Arnold Schwarzenegger's character covers himself in mud. The mud is cold and covers up his heat signature. So now he too can be invisible like the Predator. He couldn't see me. That scene from the original Predator film is alluded to when Nauru also makes her way into a mud swamp earlier in the film. But instead of the mud, it's the medicine that Nauru uses to lower her body temperature so that she too can become invisible and get the jump on the Predator. Now, let's jump back real quick to the scene of the fur trapper's camp. In this scene, another moment teasing the Predator's ultimate demise is foreshadowed. She discovers the metallic arrows that shoot from his arm do not travel where he aims his arm, but instead travel to where the red laser dots are being projected, meaning that these lasers are not just to help the predator eyeball his aim. No, they are virtually a targeting system that the arrows travel to themselves, regardless of where the predator is aiming. When that scene happened at the campsite, I knew immediately that it would come back into play. And sure enough... Nauru uses the Predator's own advanced technology against it, which was absolutely brilliant and shows that Nauru, despite her small stature and lack of technological weapons, was always destined to be the winner because she is the better hunter. I thought Prey was a fun and refreshing take on the Predator, and I think it opens the door for more films like this in the Predator universe that maybe take place in the past. I'd love to see a sequel where the Yacha who dropped off this Predator returned to Earth to pick it up, only to discover that it's been defeated by a mere mortal. And then we see Nauru lead her tribe in an epic fight against a group of pissed off Predators. But what other eras would you like to see the Predator travel to? The medieval times? The Wild West? The possibilities are endless. But what did you think about the film overall? You can let me know down in the comments below or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.